Hey everyone, I'm Rather Incoherent, and today I'll be going through my investigator tier list. I'm going to be doing strict power rankings. This isn't about fun or flavor. This is how strong I view a character to be, and more specifically, how strong I view their best deck to be. If the character has a lot of different builds, I'm looking at you, Charlie Kane. I'll be evaluating them based on what I think is their best build, and not based on a generic sort of power level. These rankings are being mostly based around two-handed solo play or three-player tables because that's what I play the most. I really have no intention of ranking around solo whatsoever. And in addition, I'm somewhat assuming your team is built around you. Whether that means just fighter clue repair or double flex player, or that you're playing someone who needs Carson Sinclair to support them and that actually gets something out of a Carson being there. You're playing a Father Mateo, for instance, and a Bless build, same with Sister Mary. I'm not assuming your team bends itself out of shape around you, but I am assuming your team acknowledges that you're there and that there's a reason for you to be there. Next up, I'm viewing the tier list this year around as just a fun thought experiment, just talking about how I perceive the characters more than anything else. It's obviously my subjective opinions about their power level, but I'm intensely poignantly aware just right now about how many holes are currently in my knowledge of the yards of the game, and I'm endeavoring to fix that as I play new characters and play old characters differently each time I do play the game. With all that said, there are two more disclaimers to get out of the way very quickly. First, this is the tier list posted by playing board games. It's much nicer than the shitty terrible one that I made, so I'll link to their channel and their tier maker in the description, although I assume just about everyone watching this will recognize this from their channel. And second, I will not be ranking parallel investigators. I've been on the fence about how to rank them for a while, and I think I finally decided. Because of the mix and match nonsense where you can be talking about normal Agnes or parallel Agnes or normal front but parallel back, or parallel front and parallel back because of all this mix and match silliness, there are technically four different investigators. If a character has a parallels version, I'll be ranking them based on what I perceive to be their best version, which Skids will be very happy to hear because it's going to put him up substantially in the tier list. But I'm not going to bother trying to rank all the different variations of the character, I'm just going to rank what I view as the best version of a character. Now, coming up to the tier list, you can see we have S, A+, A, B, C, D, and N, A. NA would be characters I'm not comfortable ranking, so I guess you could argue I'm putting parallels there, but not really. I just don't want to rank four versions of the same character. I think since I'm viewing this as a thought experiment and just talking about the game a lot, I don't think anyone's going in NA. I have something to say about everyone, I have theories about where everyone should be, so I'm not putting anyone in NA. But likewise, I'm not putting anyone in D. I think when you try to change the names into words and actually express it that way, I can't name a D in a way that makes them bad. S would be the broken characters, the ones that are genuinely offensively overpowered. A plus characters are just oppressively strong. When you look at them, they give you compelling reasons not to pick other characters. I think A tier is where most of the characters in the game live. These are just strong characters. They have few weaknesses, they have many strengths, and there's a lot of reasons to pick them but they aren't really like breaking the game open the way A+, and especially S-tier characters are. B-tier characters are good. If you build them well, they'll probably outpace the game, but they're definitely weaker than their A-tier counterparts, and this is where I should mention that I'm ranking this on standard difficulty, because B-tier characters might be substantially worse than A-tier characters on higher difficulties. That's one of the main reasons I don't like playing on higher difficulties, is I feel like it just additionally punishes the weaker characters disproportionately more. C-tier characters would be your passable characters. They keep pace with the game. And that's my issue with a D-tier. D-tier characters are bad characters, below average characters. Characters that struggle to keep pace with the game and actively hold your team down. And I think that doesn't exist. I think D-tier only exists when you're ranking them in a relativistic way, if you're saying that this is bad compared to other investigators. But I'm ranking my investigators compared to the game, not each other. So we're gonna start assembling our tier list now, and this is what we're looking at. I've only got five tiers. Broken characters, characters that are too strong, the great big gaggle of strong characters that makes up most of the characters in Arkham Horror, the good characters, and the passable characters. So, to start off our tier list, at the bottom of passable tier, in my opinion, the worst character in the game, we've got Sister Mary. Sister Mary has a god-awful stat line with four head and mystic access, with only zero to two, you really can't use it that reliably. With two books, she can't investigate. With three fish, she struggles to fight. Runic Axe, I think, helps her a lot. It helps her card pool to make her bad fist usable as a fighter. But man, making the stat line work is miserable. 
because of her usefulness in a blessed team just to put blessed tokens in the bag without everyone else running bad cards, she does get a pass. But it is rough playing Sister Mary and I have next to nothing good to say about her other than she is a functional character that keeps pace with the game, which is, I suspect, where Amina Zidane will also fall. Amina's stat line of threes across the board is just rough. Five head soak, as mystics so often get, is not that easy to deal with. And then in addition to that, Amina's card pool isn't really that good. The cards printed with her that encourage you to use not your head and other stats aren't really that good. Her ability of virtually unlimited emergency caches and potentially much better than that depending on how efficiently you're getting rid of the doom is really, really good, but you're going through so much trouble to make this stat line work with a card pool that really doesn't want to help you do it, that at the end of the day, I would rather play virtually anyone else than Amina. That includes Jim Culver, who does get to live just above her in the passable tier. Jim Culver's 5 splash lets him do a lot of interesting things that Amina can't. His forehead is like no one's talking up forehead mystics, but it's a lot better than being a three-head mystic pretending you wanted to use your other stats which is the most obvious case of Sour Grace I've ever seen. So while I don't have much good to say about Jim, being a forehead mystic is an alright place to live. In addition, he gets to have 5 Splash, which he can use on things like Deep Knowledge to more consistently hit cards he needs, or Research Librarian for true magic builds. There are so many things you can use Dumbwitch Splash on, he'll find a way to meaningfully improve his deck with them, and I think he is just clearly not the worst mystic, now that one of the Mystics has the Jitty Barnes stat line, which we're going to be seeing a lot of in the passable tier, because it turns out having terrible, god-awful do-something stats is not a good place to live. And thanks to the buffs, Lola like easily gets out of D tier. She's a passable, functional character now. But uh, yeah, that stat line still sucks. That stat line is still absolutely terrible. I feel like, honestly, her total power isn't even that far above where it used to be. Her deck building is a lot simpler now, that's definitely true. Playing her is a lot less stressful now. But in terms of her overall power level with optimized decks, I think she is stronger but not that much stronger. The big thing is just that she sucks to think about a lot less. However, I can confidently put her above Jim Culver, which I think the old version of Lola I couldn't have done. And I hate to do this. But I'm going to keep Marie right here towards the top of C tier because I just legitimately don't see her doing anything. I look at the Archaic Ghost builds and I just don't see a character that functions very well at low experience. I look at any build in Marie and I see that. I look at the new Doom assets and certainly they make her better, but I still have to look at the first part of the campaign before she has El Rubash and Abyssal Tome. I look at the first part of the campaign before she has Archaic Cliffs. Whatever she's doing, she's a rough character in the first couple of scenarios, and it never really feels like it fully stops being janky and bad. It always feels a little bit off to me, no matter how you build Marie. But she is meaningfully better than the people at the bottom of this tier. And honestly, I could put Ginny Barnes a whole lot higher on the tier list, but I can't in good conscience put her higher than this. Ginny Barnes is able to break the curve of the game in half with the Green Man Medallion, there are some scenarios where you can just sandbag for like an unpleasantly long amount of time and get a free double-double, and that's worth a lot. But also, Jenny Barnes is at her weakest in the first scenarios, and the Green Man Medallion wants you to be even weaker in those scenarios for strength later, and virtually any other character would have had an easier overall campaign than trying to set up a 100 experience Jenny deck by abusing Green Man Medallion. Now that said, when you do make your 100 experience big money Jenny deck, unsurprisingly, it is very, very good and tends to shit on most campaigns. If you get Gios and the Black Fan and play your stat line as all fives, and it doesn't take much work from there to destroy whatever it is you're trying to do. So yes, of course, Jenny works. Of course, she's good. But getting there, getting the experience to do that, getting the time in those early scenarios to use Green Game Medallion, that's miserable. If you walked in on the second half of the last scenario and someone was playing a big money Green Man Medallion Ginny deck, you would think she was like at the very top of S tier. She is legitimately that strong. But over the course of a campaign, over the course of every scenario on average, she's not even good. She is going to keep pace with the game, but this stat line is miserable and it ruins her. And you can see that I have a tendency to talk in hyperbole. 
because she's at the top of passable. She's not bad, but I will still say that her stat line ruined her. Because if she had a four in like either of these do something stats, hell, even in foot at this point in the card pool, she would just be better. Her stat line is worse than skids. It's awful. <laughs> now, moving up to my good tier, we've got Father Mateo by the skin of his teeth. With Father Mateo, I assume he's in a blessed team. It's why he gets the BNB tier, and it's why Sister Mary doesn't have to live in D tier. And in a blessed team, I think when Nikosi Mabadi and Blessing of Isis and Favor of the Sun, there's just enough going for him specifically that he can just be a better mystic than anyone in this lower tier can. I think he is actually reliably going to get a lot of work done. I can't say much more than that. He's almost the minimum a mystic can do, except he gets five experience and he has blessed synergies. And that's not a lot, but it's enough to get him into B tier just barely. Roland Banks is a character that breaks my heart to put this low on the tier list because I love Roland. But five brain with three head and a weakness that can give you random mental traumas is rough. In addition, the selling point for Roland is like you kill people, you get clues, you help your team get tempo on the main front that actually matters, you progress the game. But then you get your weakness that actually takes away like roughly most of the clues you gave your team. In the end, you actually aren't really generating very much positive clue power for your team at all as Roland, and that sucks. So you find yourself in a place where your ability isn't actually worth that much. You're very afraid of mental traumas, very afraid of horror damage. And sure, Roland's got that ungodly seeker consistency from his troll. And sure, Roland's a four-fist guardian fighter. So of course he functions very, very well. You put a flamethrower on him like with anyone else, he's going to kill people. Beat cops and machetes will do work. But at the end of the day, he is so little going for him compared to every other guardian. He's one of the only characters that has access to Seeker cards that doesn't manage to climb his way into stronger higher. Tommy Muldoon, for the longest time, lived beneath Roland on my tier list. Because for the longest time, Becky was just a trap. But now, with the addition of the last two expansions, Short Supply and Edge of the Earth and Salvage and Scarlet Keys, you can build Tommy decks that have like almost a 100% chance of hitting Becky immediately, every game and the experience score for that is not too expensive. Then you have things like custom munitions from Scarlet Keys that allow you to run all the upgrade cards and they'll all get draw now. In addition, you can upgrade it so it's like giving Becky plus two to hit if you over succeed by three, you deal an extra damage. The Super Becky deck is actually a lot less of a meme than it used to be and might be somewhat reliable now. But his ability just sort of sucks. It gives you money later. If you're not putting bullets on Becky with it, economy later is kind of worthless. You need economy early. I don't care if you can buy five Brother Xaviers in the second half of a scenario, I care how quickly you got out the first one. Which with Tommy, the answer is the same speed as everyone else. My ability doesn't give me economy early. In addition to that, while I think the Survivor card pool is very good, I don't think it's actually good at making you a better fighter, which is Tommy's job. It's like the main thing he does. I find that when you try to make him flex find clues, it gets incredibly jank very, very quickly. The economy cost and number of assets in the deck can just spiral out of control very quickly. I think Tommy's main thing, like what gives him an edge over Roland, is I think the actual stupid Super Becky deck that you build is a little bit better than traditional fighting and guardians. In addition, he has a one more sanity soak, and like like that is legitimately why he's above Roland. He's just a little bit less frail with a slightly more interesting deck build. They're very comparable in my eyes. Right now, I might be underrating Kaimani Jones. I don't think so. I played them as pure fighter, and I played them as pure fighter because I had nowhere near enough time to play assets to find clues and play assets to fight and then actually do both of those roles because Kaimani Jones' ability is incredibly action efficient. If you're trying to protect someone else as Kaimani, you have to engage an enemy off of them, evade them, and then evade them again. It's your entire turn. Whereas Tommy will just shoot over with a gun. Every Guardian can just shoot over with a gun. It's so much simpler, and it's so much more action efficient, and it really hurts Kaimani as a fighter. I think that there is a better build of Kaimani where you essentially just play a flex character, you deal with your own enemies by evading. You don't deal with anyone else's enemies, you don't deal with elites, and you just get clues, and you can run stuff like um, a single one of Knuckle Duster in your underworld market, and then towards the end of the scenario you buy that, 
So you can dirty fighting the boss and once it's evaded, it won't have retaliate. So you have like knuckle dusters and dirty fighting and some big money stuff to get you up to six on knuckle dusters. And like maybe that's a lot better than what I did. The janky combo heavy main fighter that I played, it's unstoppable late in a scenario. And that convinces me that every single character in green is unstoppable in the last half of the last scenario. Like once they're set up with 50 experience, green characters just do shit. That's what I learned on Kaimani. It's every green character. It's not just the 100 experience Jenny Barn deck, it's all of them. But there are so many points where Kaimani feels sketchy as a main fighter. If you're trying to fight for anyone other than yourself, your action is so inefficient. I think as a flex character, once I get around to replaying them, Kaimani will move up a couple of spots on the tier list at least. But I just genuinely do not think that they're that good at their own archetype. I think most other rogues, particularly Finn and Winnie, can do the same stuff Kaimani does, just easier and better. Next up, we have Calvin Wright. Calvin is a character where a good chunk of his deck is locked down. You need to not die, but you also have to take damage. And to make yourself invincible once you've used up all of your base health, that just takes up a substantial portion of your deck. You're always running Jessica Hyde, Pete Sylvester. A lot of people would argue that in addition to that, you're going to need the tarot. In addition to that, you're going to need the talisman of protection. In addition to that, you're going to need the blessing of humanity, or sorry, the spirit of humanity. You could argue that a third of Calvin's deck is just on lock, but the other two thirds, because you can do anything, your stats are like fours to sixes across the board. The other two thirds of the deck could be basically anything. There's a lot to experiment with Calvin. I think his best build is as the group's main fighter with blessed synergies. I think Signum Crucis, Favor the Sun, Ancient Covenant, and Calvin is where the survivor blessed build is at its best. I think Calvin is at his best if he's just reliably trying to do one role. And if you're going to pick between clue finding and fighting, it's a lot easier to self-sabotage and get good if you're fighting an enemy than it is if you're just trying to investigate a location. In addition to that, as a cluver, if it turns out you're good at punching rats, no one cares. But as the rat punching goon, if it turns out you have nothing to do and you can just investigate at five, everyone's going to be thrilled to hear it. So I think Calvin's best way to be built is as a blessed fighter build. And I think he actually is like surprisingly good. That said, he's still very far beneath the average because most characters in Arkham Horror are just very, very strong. And it breaks my heart that Monterey Jack isn't because man is building Monterey Jack decks an exercise in frustration. There are so many good Seeker Zero cards and being told that you are a Seeker but you only get five of them is awful. <laughs> in addition to that, a huge number of rogue cards that you really care about are level 1 to 2. Most importantly being Easy Mark and Karen's Opal, two cards that Monterey Jack would have greatly appreciated having to smooth out his economy, shrink his deck, get more experience. Especially since he needs experience because he can't put magnifying glasses in his deck, he's out of slots. He has to buy the upgraded magnifying glasses. And then in addition to that, he can't buy adaptable to try to mitigate the jank in any way. And the deck is just deeply, deeply frustrating to build at every point. But you can build a very good Monterey Jack deck. I don't think he has much going compared to like the other rogues and seekers. I think most of them have other more compelling things they can do. But I do think Monterey Jack still has a five in his foot and a four in his book and card pulls that allow him to eventually use both of these things to great effect. But I just cannot ignore that if he had Trisha's card pool, he would just skyrocket up the tier list. He's held down by his jank deck building so badly. And then we have the character on this tier list where I'm the most uncertain about where they go. Towards the top of my B tier, I've got Rita Young. They gave her dirty fighting in baseball bat too. And I still look at Rita and I still think, man, this is going to suck when I play her. But now, like with Kaimani, there's some optimism and some doubt when I say that I think Rita's going to suck when I play her. I think there's enough pieces that it actually like works smoothly and makes sense as a deck now. Whereas before, I think Rita was like a jank character that got there in the same way that some other jank characters just managed to make their shit work. Now I think Rita's like actually a cohesive, easily digestible deck that's also just stronger than it used to be. I think Dirty Fighting for Rita in particular is one of the biggest buffs she got. And as always with Rita, not having access to green just hurts her so badly because everyone else who got Dirty Fighting also got Underworld Market to reliably find it. 
but Rita's gotta find it, and she doesn't really have much in the way of droll as a survivor, and that's just a little bit rough. And of course, it wouldn't be a tier list if Joe Diamond wasn't weighing down the Seekers and being their only showing beneath A tier. When they were handing out stats, Joe Diamond just hadn't heard of the Mythos deck, so he just dump statted every single defensive stat. And there are a couple of characters in the game where you could basically move one stat anywhere and it would improve them. The three stats across the boards, they all fall into that group. Joe Diamond, Skids. Take this fist, put it in book, way better. Take this book, put it in fist. Incredibly unique and interesting investigator. Reduce either of these do something stats and put it into a Mythos defensive stat. Thank you, now I know what my job is more clearly and I'm stronger against the Mythos deck. But as it is, I'm not great at either job. The Mythos deck wrecks me. If I try to play flex, I have to play assets for both jobs, find time to do both jobs, and somehow fit in cards that protect me from the Mythos deck. And there's just not enough room in Joe Diamond for everything Joe Diamond wants to do. However, Joe Diamond does have access to a lot of cards that can help him solve any of his problems or excel in any of his roles. It's hard to build a Joe deck that's actually bad. And I currently think Joe's at his best as a mythos resistant fighter. You build around your weaknesses, you build to fight. And then when you find dead turns, much like Calvin, you just coincidentally have the ability to get clues and help out your team. In the past, I've experimented with Big Hand Joe and I just never felt like it was really all the way there. Big Hand Joe feels like the thing that promises to bring him way up the tier list. But as it stands, I've never felt like I cracked the deck, never felt like he really got there. Always felt like something held him back. And for me, he sits right at the top of the good tier. Getting into A, getting into our strong investigators, there's going to be a lot of investigators in this tier, it's where most of them live. We're going to start off with Safina Rousseau. Safina Rousseau's main problem is just that her fours and her defensive stats need to be converted into doing something. And it's really not that easy to boost those numbers up. Boosting up her head or her foot is possible, but you're going to find that you cap out surprisingly low and that you don't have any assets that are boosting you up. You're just testing at what the number is. And that lack of reliability in terms of her numbers is what really hurts her, in my opinion, because you have like a few card slots for skills and assets. A huge chunk of your deck has to be events. And no matter how I build her, I always end up in that spot where I'm like, man, she's good. She's very good. She's strong. But I really wish my foot was one higher. I really wish that I had something to make this character click just a little bit more. And I think with like a more optimal build, she could be much higher in A tier, but I don't think she could ever rise above this really. Patrice Hathaway is a character that discards her whole hand every turn, which is terrifying, and makes her very, very unique in that she's the only Mystic 2 character that doesn't want Warda protection because she literally can't use the card right. And that same problem applies to a lot of cards, where normally it's a staple card and then Patrice is like, yeah, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna discard my whole hands. That limits her deck building and playstyles to some degree, but it also gives her access to unparalleled reliability through things like corner through an abundance of very effective skill cards. It allows her to every nine turns, that's how long it takes to cycle her whole deck. She gets to play like both copies of Winging It, the third copy of Fortuitous Discovery both read the signs. Because she's cycling her deck so fast, like it's not on par with the Seeker, but it's very fast, especially for a survivor or a mystic, she's able to get a lot of action compression by just reliably hitting all of her events. She's able to get a lot of reliability out of cornered and a huge number of skill cards. She's a little bit janky and a little bit weird, but very strong. Next up, we have our first parallel ranking, it's Skids. If this were original Skids, he would be down here. He, I actually think original Skids is arguably worse than Sister Mary. On a good day, I'd put him beneath Jim. I hate original Skids. He was the first character I played. I went back and I replayed him as our group's main fighter. And everyone was like, Nick, are you sure you want to ruin this campaign for us? And I did my job and they were okay with it at the end of it. But I wasn't. I was emotionally scarred. I hate original Skids. Parallel Skids is fine, though. Parallel Skids has like... Jenny's ability, except instead of just giving you a money, it allows you to use Nimble as shortcut or manual decks as fast draw a card. Like his ability to convert skill cards into not just more money, but like lightning bolt effects is something that is so unique to him and so strong. He has the smallest deck building size of any character at 25, tied I believe with Parallel Agnes. 
and that just helps him a lot with consistency. You can run the Underworld support build where your deck size is only 20. A hard mulligan is just a straight coin flip to hit any card in your deck, which is wonderful. But my issue with Parallel Skids comes down to he's the best at enabling big money, but he's not the best at using it. His stat line just sucks. Every other character you're playing big money with, they have better fist or better book, and they're just able to have big money work better. If you have a big money build and it puts you at seven book and you investigate six times, that's a lot better than a big money build that puts you at five book and you investigate six times. So Schizo Tool has to jump through some additional hoops to get his stats to be functional compared to other big money users, and the really, really big thing holding him down, as is so often the case with green characters, let's take a look at the first half of Scenario 1. Like before you get experience, all that consistency is helping you consistently draw one copy of Lucky. It's not actually that good. Once you have experience and Skids is being consistent towards something, he gets a lot better. But when you're just working with this god-awful stat line and you haven't set up yet, it's still miserable. The fact that he ranks this high is a testament to how strong big money is. Then, for a harsh change of pace, we have Carolyn Fern, a character that I really wish I could put higher, because, like, she's super unique. She does a lot of interesting things. And since Vincent Lee is going to land right above her, I'll just talk about them both together. Carolyn's going to heal your horror, give you a resource. Vincent's going to heal your damage, give you an unexpected courage. Generally speaking, horror healing helps more characters, but unexpected courage is way more valuable than a resource. In terms of stat line comparisons, I view them both as basically three head, four book, failure foot test, and don't try to fight. Realistically, you can try to fight on both of them, it just feels like a really bad decision to me. Both of them are gonna fail their foot test, they're incredibly similar. I do think that Vincent Lee's access to survivor level one cards meaningfully makes him better than Carolyn Fern. There are a lot of good cards in Survivor 0 to 1 that Carolyn Fern isn't getting to play with. Carolyn Fern is getting Promise of Power under her practice makes perfect, and she is getting Stick to the plan. Like, those are really valuable things Carolyn gets that Vincent doesn't. But I think the main thing that it comes down to is just you get the Survivor card so much faster than a Stick to the plan setup. Unexpected Courage is just more valuable than a resource. I think Vincent Lee, despite both characters playing similarly and having some more niches, I think Vincent Lee just does it to a slightly higher level of effectiveness. Next up, let's talk about Winifred Habamock. Winifred Habamock marks the turning point in the tier list where I go from being sad that I've placed characters so low, because I would love to put all of these characters higher on the tier list. Oh, that's true with this tier. I hate having Roland and Kaimani and Calvin this low in the tier list, because I love those characters. But after Winifred, it stops being, I wish this character was ranked higher, and it starts being, Wow, there's really no way to move you up, because there's just a brick wall of good characters above this point. Winifred is very strong. Everyone knows that Rex is deduction the character, but Winifred is basically deep knowledge the character. She's just going to draw cards nonstop. She has plenty of ways to leverage her foot. She has plenty of skills and big money nonsense if she wants to build for that to convert these threes into do something stats. The new dirty fighting archetype with underworld support allows her to very consistently do her job as a fighter, or to flex and do both. Unlike Kaimani, I think she's much better as main fighter than as flex if you're doing the underworld stuff. Because if you are doing the underworld stuff, the Kaimani problem I had, where you have way too much setup time to do both jobs, does happen to Winifred no matter how you build her. Whereas Kaimani can build the underworld deck in a way that they flex fight by just evading. Whereas Winifred will have to buy all the assets, play all the assets, make the money for all the assets, use all the assets and she just doesn't have the time for it. That said, traditional flex builds of Winifred or just dedicated fighter builds of Winifred with all the new stuff are both very, very strong and she is a fantastic character. And she's far more interesting than Akachi Onelli because Akachi is just a five head mystic with more mystic juice, but damn if that isn't strong. And then in addition to that, she gets a three in her defensive stat instead of a one. She gets to use Cyclopean Hammer really good because of this three fist. And she doesn't really need anything else beyond that. Like, there's technically some other small perks of her card pool. She's not actually mono purple, but she basically is. But this is just how strong being a five head mystic with more go juice is. Charges are really good in mystic. She gets more of them. And five in your stat when it's the only stat you have, basically, is incredibly valuable. However, that doesn't mean that four stat investigators can't beat her, because Zoe is still absolutely fantastic. As always with Guardians, there's a variety of ways you can build them. I could swing a Cyclopean Hammer at 8. 
I can shoot a flamethrower at 8. I can swing a survival knife at 6, which sounds a lot worse, but it also costs much less experience and allows me to dedicate my time and cards to other goals. There's a lot of ways to build Zoe, Dunwich Slash can be used a lot of ways. I personally lean very hard towards just get two copies of Deep Knowledge to be more consistent, get two copies of Spectral Razor, because like, have you seen Spectral Razor for 8? It's part of why Agachi's so good. Spectral Razor for 8's a very good number. And then for your fifth card, blue characters are actually really boring. Get down the rabbit hole. You'll be shocked at how much experience that gives Zoe if you haven't seen that before. It's just the correct choice. There are a lot of card choices where I'm like, there's merit for and against it. I have my opinion about what's better, but I can't concretely say that what is right or what is wrong. Down the rabbit hole when Zoe is right. It's right in almost every mystic and it's right in Zoe. It's so much free experience in her. And I'm not gonna lie, Spectral Razor and Down the Rabbit Hole are a big part of why she's outranking these two by so much. In addition though, she has four head and six brain instead of three and six or three and five. And then instead of getting money much, much later once your soak is dead, you just get money as soon as you start doing your job, which is far more immediate and far more useful than Tommy's ability. Moving up, we have a character that I could put much higher, but don't feel good about putting any higher than this. It's Preston Fairmont. Preston Fairmont has the most interesting deck building in the world because he's the only character in the game where the arguably correct, I view this as the strongest way to build Preston, is to start off Dark Horse and then transition into big money. And it's this insane switch that happens where you bank a little bit of experience around the third or fourth scenario and you use double adaptable and then you suddenly like do a 10 experience four card swap shift from one archetype to the other and it's amazing. Dark Horse Preston has enough ways to bypass his stats or boost his stats that he's just gonna do his job well enough every single time. And Big Money Preston is just going to buy success over and over again and get whatever he needs done finished. In addition to all that though, there are a set of cards that you can use as a synergy package in Preston where you just get like your whole deck in play at once and then you loop these same cards over and over and over again you're just getting clues and healing people every single turn and then if you need to fight you can but that's someone else's job you're so good at getting clues and team utility at that point preston fairmont is a wonderfully powerful flex character with very unique deck building and rules but i think there are characters that just do their job well enough that they're better than them in fact i'd say it's about half the characters in the game and the very next one on the tier list very similar to Zoe, is Leo Anderson. Leo Anderson's one foot for a long time was viewed as like a severe weakness, and then we all collectively realized that two and one are the same number. And all of the other guardians, every single one of them has two foot, so this one foot's not actually a weakness. Just the same deal everyone else has. As a fighter, Leo Anderson gets access to Leo DeLuca and Haste to just do more of his job. These additional actions are also great at converting something like Hallowed Mirror into team utility as a healer, instead of just, you know, not healing your team because you're out of actions, which uh, most fighters end up spending their turns. They've spent all their turns drawing guards, playing assets, gaining resources, and fighting. They don't have the time to use Soothing Melody on other people a lot. They might do it once, maybe twice, but Leo Anderson can be reliably expected to just keep your team alive in a way that many other fighters can't. In addition, like Zoe with Down the Rabbit Hole, Leo Anderson can get Karen's Opal, and that's really, really valuable. Just having 12 more experience than the people you're competing with is very, very good. Except it's 14 because you buy it within the thick of it because you're degenerate and this is what you do in rogues now. And beyond that, yeah, he's just got the same benefits as Zoe. Four head, six brain instead of the worst numbers we've got on these more frail guardians down here. Same bonus experience. Different argument where it's making him good and I think a much more compelling argument in team healing as opposed to just, you know, spectral razor. But Leo Anderson does have substantially more setup time than many other Guardians, and that is worth noting. Moving on to a Guardian with absolutely no setup time, it's Carson Sinclair. To set up, you need to have assets that you care about playing, and Carson simply doesn't. Now, Carson scales with your teammates. If you're playing him with Jim and Jenny, you're probably not going to feel like he's very good. But if you're playing him alongside people that actually benefit from getting more actions, that don't just run out of charges immediately because they're a mystic and they're limited by charges, not turns, if you're playing them alongside people with weaknesses, for instance, a role in the banks where you can help mitigate that weakness by running soak for them. All of that stuff is really valuable. 
giving your actions to people who make efficient use of them is wonderful. Because remember, you don't give your seeker 15 actions, one on each turn of the game, you essentially give them the 15 actions they wouldn't have gotten if you weren't there. So the 15 actions that they were fully set up to get the maximum value out of. And it turns out that late game seekers or whatever type of clue finder you have are getting on average like one clue a turn. Just by being Carson, you've done your job as flex clue finder, so find a way to mitigate the mythos deck, do something to help your team, and you've earned your spot. And mitigating the mythos deck can make you tremendously more valuable if you're paired to someone like a Roland or a Winifred that has a clear weakness that you can help to mitigate. Then in addition to that, there are just a lot of cards that are very valuable cards that never get run because it's, it's not better than doing your turn normally. But in Carson, where you're giving actions to your teammates already and your stat line doesn't work, there's no alternative. You just have to use these, but they weren't bad. They were just not as good as the rest of the cards. They were just not quite the thing you considered doing. But cards like Guidance 1 that can turn Roland into a 4-action four 4-book four investigator for a turn are incredible. Cards like the new Evervigilant 4 under Stick to the Plan gives Carson Sinclair consistently the highest tempo opening in the game. Even though he's not getting any of it himself, it's tremendously powerful for your team. And the only way for Carson to be weak is if you put him on a team that doesn't want him. And that's true of like a lot of characters. Every fighter in the game is bad if you put on a team with another fighter, right? So I don't think caring that Carson's on a team with players that have weaknesses and want more actions is a big consideration. Nor do I think it's a big consideration that if you put him on a team with someone who's bad, he gets worse. That seems unfair to Carson. Most Kluvers get worse when you pair him with main fighter original skids because they're not being protected anymore. Continuing on in the strong tier, we have Ursula Downs. Ursula Downs gets shit on relentlessly and I don't really know why. She's a 4 book investigator with 3-4 defensively and 7-7 seven, seven soak, like she's not gonna die to the mythos deck. Sure, relics might be mono yellow, but it's mono yellow with Karen's Oval. I love me 14 free experience. Seekers have a lot of expensive guards, you can spend that 14 experience very well. And her ability, like sure, it's not just deduction that you declare retroactively like Rex, but it is a free investigate virtually every turn. Seekers have no problems moving. That's a thing you just reliably do. It happens most turns. Four book is enough to get to a point where you're going to successfully investigate. Like there are a lot of four book seekers that do their job very reliably. No one's criticism of Joe Diamond is that he can't pass an investigate check. It's everything else. If Rex reliably passes by two, then surely Ursula can just reliably pass. And honestly, I feel like I'm just like peer pressured subconsciously by public opinion and putting her this low. She has great defensive stats, bonus experience and seeker is insane. She has an ability that essentially can get her a clue around. It's not quite that good, but it's very close. Moving on from Ursula, we're getting towards the top of the A tier. We've got Silas Marsh. He's just very good. It's hard to build a Silas deck that doesn't reliably fight. You can build cool flex Silas decks using Mariner's Compass. Two books a little bit rough, but he has ways around it with stuff like True Understanding, where he'll meaningfully contribute. You've got the crazy Silas Net decks, or rather the Silas Harpoon decks, where you're essentially committing your entire deck to every skill test and then replaying the Harpoon over and over again to get the skills back. But honestly, I feel like I overestimate Silas because he always performs well, and I can't quite put my finger on what's contributing to that and why. Honestly, I feel like Silas always overperforms in our campaigns, and it's because he's incredibly consistently dealing two damage. Flamethrowers are kind of unnecessary. A lot of the Guardian builds, like the Zoe Samaras I recently ran on the channel, I think you are actually better off running survival knives than big weapons. And Silas Marsh is a good example of that. He's just reliably hitting for two, like very reliably hitting for two. And that's very good, it turns out. I'm not saying you should kill Hastur with a machete, but it's entirely conceivable to do so. And Silas Marsh will show you how that's done, although unfortunately he doesn't have access to machete, he'll have to use, you know, a fire axe and be poor about it. On the opposite end of the financial spectrum, we have Dexter Drake. It turns out being a five-head mystic is good, and having three in fists so that your five-head mystic gets to swing the Cyclopean Hammer better is good, and having a signature asset that allows you to search your deck for Cyclopean Hammer is also good. Dexter Drake has a lot of weird, janky nonsense that he gets to do that no one else really does in terms of how and which assets he gets to play. 
I've never looked at a Dexter Drake deck and thought, that's perfect, that's wonderful, that's strong, I love everything about that. Much like Silas, I always look at these decks and I'm like, we gotta be able to do better than that, right? It's never like a Leo deck or a big money deck or even a Mystic deck where I'm like, I understand and agree with the purpose of all of these cards. It always feels like there's so much wiggle room because none of the cards quite do as much as I want to in a Dexter Drake deck. Or if I build a super optimized Dexter Drake deck, that none of the cards really capitalize on being Dexter Drake and there's got to be something better. Which might mean that later on as the card pool grows, Dexter Drake grows into an absolute monster. But I think in this current state, Dexter Drake is just a very, very strong. Next up, we have Norman Withers. Monterey Jack sucked because he didn't get enough level zero seeker cards. Norman Withers gets all the level zero seeker cards and he has five in his book. There's like other stuff that happens later, but I'm gonna be upfront with you. If he just had like no experience cards, he was just a level zero seeker, he'd still be in strong somewhere. Like he wouldn't have fallen that much if he was just a seeker with no experience cards. But he does get experience cards, just not seeker experience cards. Thankfully, because of Astronomical Atlas, you can do dumb things where you find a way to loop deductions. And that's very silly and very strong, but it is a level zero deduction. And there are a lot of ways to get one additional clue per turn. Like, there are a lot of characters, they aren't on the tier list yet because they're very strong, that just find reliable ways to, for instance, get Ariana's Twine plus an Eon chart, which is doing literally the same thing, more or less. So what Norman Withers does by looping deductions is obviously good, but it's, it's not as crazy as I find people tend to make it sound. What is crazy is being a five book seeker with like any amount of experience cards. There's a really, really cool Norman build that no one else really gets to use where you essentially turn off the mythos bag. You just run all the ceiling stuff because on any mystic that just breaks your deck. You don't have any arcane slots or any hand slots. What are you doing? But on Norman, you are still a five book seeker. So like all you do is turn off the bag, but then you keep investigating at base five with practice makes perfect and you're just still contributing to the team. And that's a really cool support build that I can't wait to get around to playing. I've only played Norman once and it was the Astronomical Atlas stuff, but I legitimately think he's much, much better as the support character that messes with the bag. Next up, our top of the strong tier, our top of it, it's Ash Can Pete. Duke's just really good. Getting a free move action once a turn is good. Getting it twice a turn because you discarded a card is better. And uh, yeah, there's not that much to say about Ash Can Pete. Getting free move actions is just very strong. Like his card pool isn't spectacular. The Dumbwitch Splash gives him valuable stuff to help with Duke. Things like Milan, Deep Knowledge, Deductions. There are plenty of things to put in Ash Can Pete to make him a better Kluver. And make no mistake, he is a Kluver. He can swing at four. He'd rather not. Like he can kill a rat, but he doesn't want to try to fight anything bigger than that, even though he technically can. Ash Can Pete is just like the easiest character in the game to perform incredibly well with. I don't feel like it's hard to make an Ashcan Pete deck that contributes incredibly meaningfully and helps carry your team, especially in early scenarios with zero experience. But even at higher experience levels, as the card pool's gotten bigger, things like the multi-tool from Scarlet Keys can give you a huge amount of value and even team utility. But as strong as Ashcan Pete is, much like the people at the top of this tier, I would be shocked if he ever got a nerf. I think everything here in strong tier it's like roughly where you want an investigator to live. And as we start moving up, I start thinking characters are maybe a little too strong. Nathaniel Cho is a good poster child for a little bit too strong. All he does is kill Volsus, I know. And I've made videos about just killing enemies not being good enough. But like he kills them really effectively. Silas Marsh does not kill enemies at the same level as Nathaniel Cho. This is meaningfully better than what other fighters are doing because he's doing it with no setup on turn one, virtually no matter how bad the situation is, Nathaniel Cho can handle it. He is so much better at fighting than the fighters beneath them that I actually think he marks a very clear spot in the tier list where anyone below him, you can notice the difference. And then when you have a fighter that I've ranked higher than Nathaniel Cho, there's just not enough enemies in the game to see that Nathaniel Cho is better at killing than they are because they're all gonna do their job perfectly. And I think, once we're arguing about whether or not doing your job perfectly is enough, you're probably too strong. Next up on the tier list, we have Diana Stanley. 
I went back and forth on Diana a lot. She's been bouncing around between the middle of Too Strong and the bottom of Strong for the longest time. Ultimately, I think she's just good enough with stuff like Dragon Pole and Cyclopean Hammer that she becomes a very, very powerful flex character, using assets to fight in her hands and clue-finding assets in her arcane slots. Her starting one head is rough. The fact that she's going through so much effort to be a six-head mystic sucks. Because Agnes just plays Pete Sylvester and gets there. And, like, that's way easier. And also now she has infinite horror soak. And better foot. So, the six head is not what makes Diana Stanley too strong. But the increased economy that you get from her ability. The fact that she does eventually become a five or six head mystic. The way her stat line lines up with her card pool and her ability to just reliably do everything. I do think Diana Stanley is one of the stronger flex characters in the game, and with characters in Too Strong, I wouldn't really expect to see them nerfed. I think this is like where you expect the overpowered characters to be up in a game. I don't think these are problematically strong. I think that they're strong enough that they overshadow other characters, but I don't expect to see them nerfed. Because I mean, who in their right mind nerfs Will Yorick? He's just fun. He's not broken in a way that makes the game worse, he's broken in a way that makes the game better. Will Yorick is the worst fighter I've ranked in a while. Nathaniel Cho kills way better than him. Dexter Drake, better than him. Silas Marsh, way more consistent than him. These guys have access to Flamethrower. But if you're running a survival knife build, which I tend to do, I did it on Zoe Samaris very recently, then Will Yorick is working with the same tools. And I think that Will Yorick's just raw reliability in terms of not dying to the Mythos deck is very valuable. I think that cards like Delve Too Deep should be banned from your table, because while the experience cost of cards in the pool are balanced around permanent assets that give you more experience, Delve Too Deep warps campaigns and makes you too strong in the latter half of them, but that's just part of Will Yorick. You can't ban his signature asset. And yeah, it turns out getting seven more experience over a campaign is very good, but that's not why he's here. I'm just mentioning it because it's important. He's here because he can't die. Like, he can, but he's not going to. That's not a real concern you have. Moving up the tier list, we have Finn Edwards and Bob Jenkins. I have them side by side, I brought them at the same time because I think they're both great poster children for just abusing the shit out of big money. Their stat lines, their four in book and their three in fist, not that good. Put plus two on both of those stats, six and five is a lot more usable. Finn Edwards and Bob Jenkins build very different decks and play very different games, but they're both elevated tremendously by access to the big money archetype it fits much more naturally in Bob than it does in Finn, whereas Bob's like, hey, if I don't play big money, I'll just die to my weakness. Whereas with Finn, you have a bunch of other things you could be playing. But in both of them, there's just a lot of different strong things available to them. Their weakness in head, like, they have good sanity soak. They're not like skids. They don't have trash sanity soak. Where are you, skids? Six is like as low as you can go without being terrified. Eight and seven are both much better. Savant exists. Gias and Savant play together so nicely because during the mythos phase it's not your turn so if you have black pan and gios and commit a savant you're testing at what number is that it's outrageous you're testing at nine on finn in that situation i assume yeah one higher ten on bob you're just able to absolutely without any difficulty mitigate your weaknesses to the mythos deck you're able to very aggressively play clue games you're both able to flex although finn is much better at it bob is much more of a main cluever and they're both just very, very strong characters. Minty Fan marks a turning point in this tier list. Before Minty Fan, everything fundamentally sort of feels fair, like you're playing the game the way it's intended. And Minty Fan is the upper limit of that. Minty Fan is gonna be damned if she ever stops for less than two clues. Mariner's Compass, Sharp Vision, Deduction. Technically, she's only stopping for one clue if she investigates normally after hitting, say, Nature of the Beast, but Nature of the Beast was fast, get a clue, so same difference. Resourceful to get the sharp vision back. There's so many ways for Menti Fan to get two clues or more at a time. And then in addition to just the raw tempo of having access to Seeker cards and Survivor cards, she gets to pile onto that the team support of Analytical Mind plus a Dream Diary, so she can just throw Unexpected Courage plus across the map. Then she gets to run Archive of Conduits, because people might be relying on you. There might be a fan who's like, hey, can you just make my head not suck during the Mythos phase? And maybe you can't. Maybe you draw badly and Finn's dying because he thought you were going to save him and you didn't. 
But if you're an archive of conduits, you're gonna like spend two actions and have him draw four cards and heal four horror and he'll never die now and he'll be very grateful instead of feeling betrayed. Min has incredibly high tempo, incredibly high team support, and everything above Min starts getting progressively more degenerate. I think this is the turning point for that. There's nothing below Min that I would call degenerate, but starting with Daniela, I would kind of call Daniela degenerate. Most people, when they engage an enemy so that it'll kill them, they have to like use a guard dog or a survival knife. Daniela just like engages an acolyte and the acolyte dies. Just immediately, no dice pull, it just happens. There is no three health hump for Daniela. She hits it with the machete and then it touches her and it dies. She can run infinite soak. She's not doing it the William York way. She's doing it the Calvin Wright way with those infinite soak assets. She just gets an insane stat line. 4152 is like the most optimized stat line in the game. It's the inverse of Harvey Walters, who you'll notice we haven't seen yet. It's an incredibly good stat line. There is literally not a better split that has been printed. Her ability is nuts. The fact that she doesn't get access to high-end Guardian stuff, yeah, that sucks. She'd be way stronger if she did. But she's still invincible and just incredibly good at killing. She's not as good as Nathaniel Cho at killing in general, but at action compression in terms of killing small enemies, she's actually far better than him, which is an alarming statement. But to be honest, Daniela doesn't really feel that degenerate. Much like men, she's the upper end of what feels fair for her job. Charlie Kane doesn't feel fair. Go watch my Scarlet Keys playthrough if you don't understand just how badly this man snaps Summoned the Hound in half. Summoned Hound is a card that never got ran, even with the chance encounter combo in pretty much any serious deck. It was a meme, it was cool, and while it was a strong effect, it never felt worth the investment to try to make it playable. And then Charlie Kane came on the scene, he stole men's card pool of Seeker Survivor. He could steal any card pool, but why would you steal a different card pool than Seeker Survivor? So he'll just draw his whole deck, get that combo and play. And yeah, his stat line might say ones, but his book is actually a five now, because he'll be investigating three times at five every round as lightning bolts. So yeah, his stat line does suck, and he will always be afraid of the Mythos phase. That doesn't really change. But summoned hounds get abused by Charlie Kane to such an ungodly degree. It's hard to describe him as anything other than degenerate because of that deck. Without summoned hound, he probably lives around here. Like he's very similar to Calvin Wright and that his ability just promises that your stat line will stop being trash. And that in making that ability do its job, you're going to be getting infinite soak in play. But Charlie Kane's infinite soak is because he keeps killing medical students and not because his assets stay around forever, which is far less action and resource efficient. Like he probably lives very similarly to Calvin somewhere in good tier without Summoned Hound. But Seeker Survivor Summoned Hound is um, degenerate. Degenerate is the word for it. Next up, we've got Trish. Much earlier, I said that if Monterey Jack just, you know, got Rogue 5, Seeker 2 or the inverse, he'd have been incredible. Well, Trish got Rogue 5, Seeker 2. And yeah, sure, there's completely degenerate shit you can do in Trish. You can run Red Clock 5, Eldritch Sophist, Pendant and the Queen, and use that to constantly keep the clock on gain two actions by pulling the charges that you're generating off the clock and putting them on Pendant of the Queen so that you're just teleporting around the map, stealing clues from anywhere and auto evading enemies, which by the way is wholly redundant in Trish since you could just get the clue and use your ability to evade them, but aside from the point. On top of that, she's a green character that can do big money. She has Seeker Draw to make it consistent and four in her main stat, so boosting that by the numbers you get with Black Fan and Gios is incredible. Six Brain is acceptable. You have ways to make this two head not matter. Like Trish is just really, really strong. You can build her for tempo. You can build her for big money combos. She's going to break the game if you build her to do degenerate stuff like stopping the clock. And if you build her to do anything else, she's still probably going to end up somewhere lower in the two strong tier. But man, her degenerate combos are real degenerate. Next, we've got Mandy Thompson. For the longest time, she was very, very much the top of S tier, the most busted of the busted. I thought we killed her. I thought adding 20 cards to a deck that was defined by its consistency would be taking Mandy out behind the shed and putting an end to her tyranny. She's fine. She's still absolutely incredible. It turns out if you make a five book seeker with good defensive stats, 
it doesn't matter which of their 50 cards they draw, they're going to do really powerful shit. However, Nandi's ability still gets her an insane amount of card draw, a lot of consistency in what she's drawing. It still gets her the ability to assemble powerful combos like double Ariadnas plus double Eon Chart to just cheat out actions nonstop. So yeah, Mandy with her 50 card deck, she's been slowed down enough that I think she's more of a toolbox character and she's still like, she's still gross and still too strong. But it's much more okay than it was. It's appalling that such a severe nerf didn't kill the character. Because before I was like tentatively putting her at the bottom of strong and she's she's still like better than Charlie Kane and the dog. She's still insane. Next up in our two strong tier, we had to zoom out a little bit to fit everyone on the screen. We're bringing in Jacqueline Fine. Five head mystics are good. This is where you get to live if you're a five head mystic. If Akachi had no additional cards and no additional text, that have still put her above Winifred. Being a five head mystic that gets to basically guarantee you pass one test every turn is really good. Getting your signature asset out and doing that twice is incredible, and then you get to do it for your team on scenario critical tests that might keep them alive or progress the scenario, and that's absolutely ridiculous. But I don't have her in my broken tier. And in fact, I have three characters left in my two strong tier that I think are all meaningfully better than Jacqueline. And that's really starting to get to the point where it's like, yeah, this is too much. These characters are too good. Moving on to the next character, we have Lily Chen. When I first evaluated her after playing her through Carcosa when Edge of the Earth came out, I said that if she got just a little bit stronger, she might be in the S tier. And they nerfed Cyclopean Hammer, but Lily Chen probably cares less about that than anyone else due to her foot ability allowing her to deal burst damage against bosses, and the nerf essentially only affects bosses. And then, furthermore, I think Lily is so good at killing that she can get by with a survival knife and not waste the experience on a Cyclopean Hammer, spending that experience elsewhere to help her team in the form of things like Charismas and Brother Xavier's and Tetsuo's to help soak for her team. I made a video about this very recently, where I think once you're good enough at killing, stop trying to be Nathaniel Cho, start trying to be Tony Morgan. You'll notice we haven't ranked him yet. I think Lily Chen is insanely good at killing. You start with Five Fist, we untabooed Machete, we added Runic Axe. You just have enough weapons that you can do your job as a five-fist fighter in scenario one. Then you grow up into a guardian. You get really, really good at killing things. And you start trying to help your team. Stand together threes. Soak for them. Whatever you can to get value elsewhere. Because when you use your foot discipline and you use spectral razor, sweeping kick, and then stab them with a machete, you don't need anything else. You will kill the boss. You're good. If you need more than five attack actions to bring a boss down, something's gone horrifically wrong, and no amount of changing your deck or character is going to fix the fact you just pulled five auto fails in a row. I think Lily Chen is incredibly good at fighting, and I think she has access to some guardian cards that give her meaningful utility for her team, in addition to getting the disciplines that make her 4 4 defensively, that give her access to just healing herself as a base ability she has with her head discipline, she's very, very strong. But I don't think, just as a philosophy, the way I look at the game, I don't think she has enough going for her beyond just being a fighter to really get into that broken tier. Next up, we have our third mystic to just barely be gatekept out of my S tier by my incredibly high standards. Luke Robinson is ridiculous. He has the highest mobility in the game as a character whose class gives him no mobility. Mystics are defined by their shit mobility, and Luke Robinson gets three copies of Elusive at minimum per scenario, except they don't cost cards or resources, which is a little bit wild. In addition to that, his abilities as a seeker let him run so much draw and research librarians and Mr. Rooks that he is the one character that can consistently run a true magic setup and not feel like it's janky trash where he's struggling to find his spells and his twilight and his true magic luke gets to buy one copy of true magic and get three hits for it and then search for it with deep knowledge and mr rook he's the single most self-reliant powerful flex character in the game but he has no real team utility beyond just the raw power he's bringing and i think the main reason he doesn't get higher on this tier list it's just that as a forehead investigator with five in health, 
he's not that strong. He is vulnerable. Like in those early scenarios before you upgrade your spells, you're feeling that forehead. Even with Hawkeye, you got to get a bit lucky to hit your head boost. Five head is just a scary place to live. There's no change in that. Even with Mr. Rook for Soak, you aren't happy about five head. Or sorry, five hearts, five meat. Now, despite all of that, I'm not explaining why Luke is bad. He's at the top of my overpowered tier. He's incredible. These are just the reasons that he doesn't get to be in my S tier. The reasons my incredibly high standards won't let him rise any higher. But there's one more character in Too Strong that is, um, let's just talk about Clue Drop or Daisy. Daisy's always been a fantastically powerful character. The Clue Dropper archetype in Daisy is nuts. It revolves around using an action on a tome to get multiple clues. Guess who gets to do that for free? Its main selling point is that Mailson is the single best Mythos control card in the game. It's like up there with the text on Gloria for just how busted it is. You can draw an elite enemy from the Mythos deck and Mailson can just say, no, screw that, put him in the discard pile. Mailson functionally can kill an elite enemy that you drew from the deck. And that is wild. And the whole sales pitch for the clue dropping archetype is you have a bunch of cards that have really strong effects. Gain an action, get plus three to a test, negate any mythos card in the game. And their cost is that you should be losing a clue, but by dual wielding research notes, it instead gives you a clue. You just have to go through the effort of picking it up. So essentially, I just described the most broken set of assets in the game. Why doesn't Daisy Walker get to live up here, especially when you combine her purple card pool? Putting Promise of Power into practice makes perfect. Getting access to Warder Protection Level 2. She's so good, why is she not an S? The answer is more or less strictly to do with setup time and experience cost. Everything in the Clue Dropper archetype that actually is good cost experience. And you pretty much want all of it, and you want all of it in play. So once you buy all these cards, you still have to play the scenario and set up and get everything in its position. And that just means that it has like bad tempo initially. It will make up for the tempo. Much like big money rogues, you will make up for the tempo you spent setting up. That's not even a debate, it will happen. That's why setup archetypes can be good is because of the promise that you will buy back the tempo you lost during setup. But it still has that setup time and it's not a small amount of setup time. In addition to that setup time, you need the experience. In scenario one, Daisy Walker, just like doesn't really have that much going for her. Don't get me wrong, she's a five book seeker with promise of power. So that's a great place to live. But she's not doing anything completely broken. If Daisy Walker got to be playing this clue dropper archetype from turn one, scenario one, she'd be at the very top of my S tier. But she doesn't, and that balances her out enough to keep her just out of my S tier. So let's talk about some real degenerate awful, broken investigators. It's my boy. At the bottom of S tier, I convinced myself to do it. It's Mark Harrigan. Like Lily Chen, he gets to run Brothers Avdir, Tetsu Amori, Hal and Mirror 3. Unlike Lily Chen, he gets to draw every card in his deck pretty much instantly, and that's kind of a big deal. And that's more or less the whole difference, in my opinion, between Lily and Mark. There's like a lot more that's different between them, but mostly it's just that Mark Harrigan gets to do that. Sure, Lily Chen's using survival knives, and I'd rather be using a flamethrower on Mark, but that's not why Mark's ranking higher. They're both killing everyone. The reason I rank Mark so highly is because he can so reliably draw through his deck to soak for his teammates, and that's just super, super powerful. Oh, uh, I thought this goes without saying I should mention it, though. He killed everyone. They showed up, he shot them, they're dead. That's just what happens when you have a Mark on the team. Next up, we've got Wendy Adams. Wendy Adams has this thing where she uh, she doesn't know what the red token is. She doesn't know what you're talking about, like survivors are red, but there's no survivor token in the chaos bag, and that's kind of a big deal just for any character. But especially if you're going to make a character based around using four foot to recur, pilfer, and backstab, not ever drawing the auto feel is kind of a big deal. In addition, 4-4 four, four are great mythos stats, Pete Sylvester allows her to convert those stats into 5-5s, five most green characters don't get access to red guards, so Pete Sylvester and Track choose to boost the one stat they care about? Yeah, they don't get that. Preston does, but Preston's not a Foot Matters character. So Wendy Adams gets to use the Foot Matters archetype better than virtually every rogue. In addition, she's impervious in the Mythos deck and can't roll autofail. And she has the best event recursion in the game. 
and Underworld Market got printed within her XP range, so now she can incredibly reliably draw lockpicks level 1, and also Thieves Kits exist now, so she can use those as well. I can't figure out how to build a Wendy deck that doesn't just absolutely destroy the game. I rank characters ignoring that infinite combos exist. There aren't many characters for that matter. Joe Diamond is one of them. Wendy Adams is another. Wendy Adams can just like discard her whole deck intentionally using Daredevil, use Yaddle to mill her weaknesses, and then recur whatever she wants for the rest of the game and just tell the game what happens. It's ridiculous. It's busted. I'm pretending that doesn't exist, and all of her other decks aren't even that much worse than Daredevil Yaddle combo Wendy. Harvey Walters is here to remind you that Seekers are broken, and it doesn't matter what other card pool you give them, just Seeker should be good enough. Previously, Mandy was the unparalleled god of consistency, but with her new 50 card deck, Harvey Walters is your new god. Harvey Walters can draw his entire deck, like every third turn if he wants to, if he really puts his mind to it. I would know, I played Carson Sinclair, the motherfucker just stopped playing soap cards. It was like, no, Carson, you'll protect me, and cycled his deck, I think, twice in four turns. I don't even know why he was doing it, because that's not the important part of the memory. Harvey Walters can assemble whatever combo he wants, as long as it's all yellow and neutral cards, obviously, pretty much instantly. But that's fine, because most of the broken combos are reliant on yellow cards anyway. Ariadna's Twine and Eon Chart. Fingerprint Kit level 4 and Emergency Cash level 3. There's just like a huge variety of different broken combos, Farsight, and literally all of the events. It doesn't really matter which combo you pick, it doesn't cost that much experience, there's not that many things you need to put your experience in as Harvey. You like, like really you just need a bulletproof vest and then you're good to go. You come into scenario one and you're like performing at the same level as a Mandy Thompson because your stat line is actually just Daniela's, it's flipped. It's 4512, you just swapped your do something stats around to be the different version, to be the clue finding version instead of the fight version. You're better against the Mythos deck than Mandy. You are as good at investigating as Mandy. You're better at consistency than Mandy. Harvey's the only character with enough draw in his deck to reliably claim he's a flex fighter using only a cult lexicon. And that's not a small part of why he's here. If it weren't for a cult lexicon, I think Harvey would probably live around there. But because he's so much better at using it than everyone else, so much better at filling his hand to discard, so much better at finding economy to fund, Harvey can just meaningfully contribute to fighting all game long with the cult lexicon. And that is kind of a big deal. His weakness does nothing. If you think his weakness is going to kill him, you, you're just wrong. Run two copies of Mr. Rook, buy one bulletproof vest, even that's erring on the side of caution. The bulletproof vest is just like a reasonable amount of safety that you should probably plan on having. It's mostly there in case you auto fail grasping hands more than for your weakness, because barring bad RNG, you should not be dying there. Like Harvey Walters doesn't have a weakness. His weakness is that the game will oftentimes tell him he's won before he got to show how many clues he found. Or that when he tries to help fight, his fighter will get mad at him and wonder why the fighter's there if Harvey gets to kill the enemies without pulling from the bag. I think we're at the point in the tier list where every single time I show the next character, I can talk about them like they're the best character in the game, and on a given day, you might catch me sincerely believing it. I think with Mark Harrigan, I would never say that he's the best character in the game, but if you catch me on a day where I'm feeling the Wendy hype or the Harvey hype, I would tell you they're the best character in the game. I don't know, maybe I wouldn't tell you Agnes Baker is the best character in the game. This is the non-parallel version. I think she's best built with the vanilla stuff as a group's main fighter. Pete Sylvester gets you the best mythos resilience of any mystic, gives you infinite horror soak, which is great for popping painkillers as beat cops and now healing your health, which is the one thing that might have killed you before you started doing painkillers. In addition, you get a second copy of Word of Protection in the form of a Test of Will, except now you're a fighter a lot of these characters are flexors or clue finders, like most purple characters aren't best built as pure fighters because they suck at moving, but they have a hard time walking over to an act like killing them and getting back to protect the person they're supposed to be protecting, whoever's finding clues. And then in addition, outside of Brand of Gathaga, they suck at dealing one damage, but Agnes Baker has ways to deal one damage. Her movement, yeah, no, it's not any better, but she's gone a long way to fix that, and she gets extra copies of Warder Protection, which as I talked about with Merc, 
To be a broken fighter, you need to offer some team utility, and four copies of Warden Protection is kind of a lot of team utility. So it's a little bit weird to me that Stella Clark has three copies of Warden Protection as her signature asset. I guess that's a smooth enough segue into what the hell is going on with Stella. She was always great. Um, I don't think anyone ever argued that she was like below A+. But now with the advent of Difficulty Zero and Stella being the only character that previously wanted to run Quick Learner, which is, aside from Daryl, the only consistent enabler of the archetype, yeah, uh, Stella got a huge buff. She just gets to find like all the clues now. Previously, she was probably best built as a sort of janky fighter because you don't want to be a fighter that can't fight until your third action, right? That sucks. But now I think Stella lives in a spot where she's just best built as the group's main cluver. She's so resilient to the Mythos deck, she can hand out some of her Mythos resiliency in the form of neither Rain nor Snow, but I mean, she had 3-4 in her defensive stats and 8-8 eight, eight Soak, like she was completely fine without those. Those really can be freely given to teammates. Stella is just incredibly strong. She's not gonna die. She's gonna super reliably do her job. And with the advent of difficulty zero, I think she's going to crush her role instead of just doing it well. I believe last time I did a tier list, I said Stella Clark is the only character that will always do more than their fair share. I no longer think that's an accurate statement. I think that's still true, but I think now Stella Clark is a character that you can reasonably expect to literally crush their job if they're the main clover, no matter what comes out of the back. It literally doesn't matter. Shed a light doesn't pull tokens, failure gives their action back. Stella Clark just doesn't give a shit anymore. Wendy doesn't draw the auto field token, but Stella doesn't care that it's there. And that's arguably much, much worse. But I mean, like, what if your ability was just deduction? Still a pretty compelling argument for Rex Murphy, right? Rex Murphy still has 3-3 defensively. Like, I know we've seen some Seekers that make 3-3 look not that great. We've got 4-2 over here on Harvey, 4-3 on Ursula. Rex's stat line is honestly just okay compared to a lot of the shit on Seekers. And then like every Guardian and every Rogue is looking at Rex with Envy. It's gross how good Seeker stat lines are. But Deduction's just really damn good. And for Rex's flex cards, you get to do awful, awful things like Lucky Cigarette Case, Leo DeLuca, Promise of Power. Rex is insanely strong. His flex cards do so much work. His ability gives you just a clue around. He has nothing that synergizes with him, and that sounds like a bad thing, but because Seeker cards are so good, like when you play Harvey, you want to start building towards Farsight or Fingerprint Kit combos or whatever you're comboing. When you play Mandy, it used to be Mr. Rook, now it's a million other things. When you play Menti Fan, it's Dream Diary, Ursula, it's Pathfinder or Eon Chart. Daisy Walker, clue dropping. Rex just buys deduction level two or cryptic research like right away. He's just done. The deck is finished on zero experience. So Rex Murphy just immediately gets to start buying whatever the strongest generic seeker cards are. And there's no shortage of them. The most secretly disgusting thing about Rex is that he's actually a support character. He runs two copies of Deep Knowledge, two copies of Promise of Power, a Faustian Bargain, Archive of Conduits. Cryptic writings, or sorry, cryptic research times two. All of that can be played on your teammates. You can draw so many cards for your team, give them so many resources, get them through so many mythos tests. He's absolutely incredible team support, but he's so strong that the idea you would give it to someone else is baffling because you're obviously more important than they are. And he's not the top of my tier list. He's not even third place. You know what's better than one deduction a turn? like four deduction level twos every other turn, which is not an inaccurate summary of Amanda. You can build Amanda decks where like, you just tell your team, don't make me waste an action. I'm not fighting. I'm not evading. I'm not doing a scenario test and I'm not exploring. Are we clear? And then you do your setup and you draw eight cards with perception on turn one. And you probably got some clues in there or something, like you don't really give a shit, but it probably happened. And then on turn two, you just play deduction a million times. And then on turn three, you probably do some more setup with drawing cards with unrelenting. And then on turn four, it's deductions again. And you've probably cycled your deck about now. Depending on how much experience you have, you may have been playing the red gloved man and been invincible during all this. It, it really depends. But one way or another, if Amanda Sharp is in your team and you are struggling with clues, that is called a user error. 
or someone secretly filled the bag with autofill tokens and no one noticed yet. Amanda Sharp is just so insanely good at finding clues. And that's all she does. She doesn't do anything else. If you build her to do other stuff, it makes her worse. You don't need to put Vicious Blow in there. That's not your job. Don't make yourself worse at the thing you're the king of to try to contribute on something that doesn't need your help. And I mean, you can. You can run two copies of Vicious Blow. You can run just one copy of Vicious Blow. You can run an occult lexicon. You can run Ancient Souls. There are so many ways you can make yourself a little bit less consistent at Amanda's job in exchange for helping with the fighting front because Seekers aren't okay and Amanda has even more options than most thanks to Vicious Blow Red Gloved Man. But none of that matters. She's ranked here just because of all the characters in the game, no one can snap the clue tempo in half the way she can. Gloria Goldberg has a house rule at my table that we aren't allowed to play her our first time through a campaign. Clue dropping archetype also got that house rule as of our first playthrough of Scarlet Keys once we saw what it did. Because they warp the campaign so much by neutering the mythos deck. On our first playthrough of a scenario featuring bears very heavily, we never saw a bear. On several scenarios in Innsmouth, the Deep One Bull never showed up. It was just weird. He, he wasn't there. He was away from home. Must have been out at sea doing something else. I don't know. Gloria Goldberg's ability is so easy to enable to just strip the challenge out of the Mythos deck and then assign what's left to the people who can handle it. Which shouldn't be hard to do because you have a five head mystic in Gloria. So between the wards of protection and just the five head, presumably someone else can eat the other half of the Mythos deck. Like put any rogue in the team, right? But also, she's a five-head mystic, and we've talked about this. Like, she does other stuff. She just can fight or flex or find clues really, really good, too. So, yeah, um, there's not a lot to say about turning off the game while still being incredibly strong. She's obviously broken. I don't know how on earth you could have a different opinion on her. And we're getting to the point where it's upsetting me how good characters are. Because I have two characters above Gloria. <laughs> Tony is ridiculous. Like, yeah, you can make the enemies not show up, but Tony could just take any mythos test he was going to draw and kill any enemy that everyone else could have drawn to. Like, Tony doesn't fail to kill things. He's the only character, in my opinion, that kills at the same level as Nathaniel Chow. He's the only one who's even close. There are a couple of people who are like in the same ballpark, but no one that I can make a straight face argument for as being just as good other than Tony. The difference is that Nathaniel has 3-2 defensively and only has 6 in his brain, whereas Tony might look like he has 5 in brain, but that number is actually infinite because Lonnie Ritter is going to fix his coats forever, and green characters can just like not ever die to horror if they bend their deck around it a little bit, which they probably should because dying to horror is their main weakness. And then in addition, that 3-2 defensively might look better than 2-2, but Well Connected says that Tony can only fail a Mythos test on auto fail. And also, the big money stuff I'm talking about right now, it also gives him six action turns, which are obviously great for stabbing. He's really good at stabbing, but he also could just like spend those six actions with his now five book to um pick up clues, which normally would be a weird thing for a fighter to do, but considering he's been setting up with a big money deck with five action turns, he probably finished setting up a little bit before most other people. And he does that really consistently because of the seeker draw that he gets access to. So where was I? What was I complaining about? There's a lot to complain about with Tony. Oh, yeah. When he finishes setting up, which he does faster than anyone else and more consistently than anyone else because he has so many actions and so much draw, he just happens to be able to find clues. And you might think that's not the fighter's job, but... He did the fighter's job. He set up. He's done setting up. He killed everyone. They're dead. And you didn't finish your half of the game because, like, you're presumably not Amanda or Rex. So I guess he'll help there, too. Tony's gross. If through some fucking miracle you found an enemy that threatened to kill Tony, first, it would have to survive for two turns of straight auto fails because he'll kill most bosses in two turns without really being afraid of the damage at all. Even a 3-3 slap from, like, a huge boss is not going to do anything to Tony. But provided he gets hit by the second 3-3 slap and does have to start worrying, he can use Well Connected to trip the boss. Like, it doesn't matter what the game tries to do, Tony will just 
do his role, survive, and then help other people. One of the grossest things about Carson is giving guidance to characters like Tony, characters like Roland, where they almost have the ability to find clues. But unlike Roland, Tony just gets to five book normally. Like, it's not even what he's trying to do. He just wants the Gios and the Black Fan to protect against the Mythos phase and to get more actions, and he accidentally turns into a Kluver. It's crazy. But I still think Daryl's worse. I still think Daryl's the most broken thing in the game. You know how Rotten Remains is a scary card because it can just auto-fail and deal three damage to you? What if I told you auto-fail dealt one damage because that's what Gumption does, and Daryl's ability is just Gumption. It's legally distinct from Gumption, so you're allowed to stack them, which is very important for a lot of broken combos he does. But Daryl has the ability to trivialize virtually every Mythos test, virtually every scenario test in the game. Gloria turns off the Mythos deck. Daryl kind of does. He doesn't really. He only does it for test. But he turns off, like, the thing you're supposed to do. He turns off the other part of the game. He looks like he has bad soak. Defensively, it's like two head, three foot, six, eight. Your weakness could deal you up to four horror damage. He looks really frail. In my playthrough of Dream Eaters, I don't recall taking damage really. It just like didn't happen. It's not a thing that occurred to Daryl. Originally, I planned on using scavenging and protective gear for infinite soak because I thought he would be frail. And I could do that. Like if I just want to let Azathoth slap me over and over again and before the Black Throne, Daryl's one of the only characters that can survive that. But, um,. It turns out, aside from unmitigatable damage, nothing hits Daryl for anything in the first place, so there's no reason to bother with running more soak than just the Milan, I guess. He's got five books, so like he's great at his job, but he doesn't need five books because his whole thing is that he reduces the difficulty to zero and then plays Shadow Light so he doesn't even have to roll. I mean, sometimes he doesn't. Frequently he doesn't, so he does have to roll. And then he'll succeed and get evidence, making it possible to do it again next turn. He has an almost infinite combo. For five resources, he can play both True Survivor and Shadow Light. Shadow Light auto succeeds, meaning it can use double resourceful to pull the other copy of Shadow Light and the True Survivor and the gumption you're committing to the Shadow Light test. So for two actions and five resources, you're looping a guaranteed success for four clues. And that is fairly expensive, but these are all just cards you already ran because they were already amazing in your deck. You don't need to play for this, it's just a thing you could have available in the deck for the cost of one true survivor that's a little bit suboptimal. And while five resources is a lot, the deck is dirt cheap. There's really nothing else to spend your Milan money on in the late game. And it's not like you're doing nothing between that. You're still like a six book investigator with Milan out, doing your job with old key ring three out, getting multiple clues on low shroud locations, crushing high shroud locate. He's just gross. He crushes his role. He has pseudo-infinite combos that let him do it even more. He turns off scenario cards in a way that no other character can. My Yorick was complaining in Scenario 1 that he was fighting a 5-5-2 enemy and he wasn't able to deal with that. So I told him to trip it and he said, Dude, I'm Yorick, I got three foot. I know I'm up one, but that's a bad plan. And I told him, Nah, man, that guy doesn't have Hunter and I can spend one whole evidence to make the difficulty of this test zero. So you break his ankles, I'm gonna flash my camera in his eyes, and we're just gonna walk away and leave this guy, he can he can have this location, we're done here. And we did. As the Kluver, I allowed a fighter who was failing in his role to essentially kill an enemy for a resource that I generate for doing my job. I'm a little bit like tuckered out from complaining about the S tier characters, I'll be honest. I'm having a hard time really emphasizing enough just how gross Daryl is, why he gets to live here instead of like there or like down here. Until you see just like how steady a stream of evidence you can get off Hawkeye cameras and an empirical hypothesis and his Kodak and just how many things his ability can turn off. There's a Mythos card and Dream Eaters that says do a fist or foot test or you cannot leave your location. Every single time that came up, I used an evidence on it and we would have failed and just wasted an action without Daryl if I were any other character. At the start of Scarlet Keys, I mentioned that locked doors are a surprisingly big problem that I never really noticed in my first playthrough, but four fist tests, like you don't get to use your weapon, is actually kind of hard for a lot of teams to handle. 
Daryl just turns that door off. Like, I'm not gonna say turn it to zero, but turning it to two makes it trivial for every guardian in the game. The amount of team utility that Daryl has for a character that is basically unkillable while absolutely demolishing his role is insane. And that's the common trend among my top three characters. The difference is that both of these characters can still conceivably have a situation where your teammates scroll rotting remains into auto fail and die. But Daryl Simmons doesn't have that situation. If you have a teammate who dies as Daryl Simmons to rotting remains, one of you played wrong. Because you should have been together and you should have saved their life. And before I wrap up this video, I've had a lot of fun just like generally talking about investigators, going on about my current opinions on things. But this is an adjustment to the tier list that I could make. I don't agree with this necessarily, but I think if you capped off strong tier with men and then moved everyone in broken down after Gloria, I do think these tiers are a little bit weird now. I don't think these people at the bottom deserve to be in the same tier as these at the top. Same here. I don't think Daniela and Charlie are doing the same shit as like Amanda and Stella. But if there was a tier that was just these three characters, I think they're head and shoulders above everyone else in the game. Even the other people I'm putting my S tier pale in comparison to Daryl, Tony, and Gloria. So with the tier list explained, having voiced my thoughts on all the investigators, what closing thoughts do I have? First, what I view as the weakest set of characters in the game, Father Mateo and Down, all suffer from the same problems. Their do something stat isn't good. They are forehead mystics. They have threes across the board, or in the case of Sister Mary, they are a fighter, or at least they claim to be, with only three fists. In the top half of this set, we can see six seekers in the two highest tiers, grossly overrepresented compared to everyone else. Seekers are just very strong, but I will say that Scarlet Keys did a lot to improve the balance. They gave seekers cute stuff largely and new stuff that for like different archetypes, but they didn't really buff pre-existing seeker decks much. With the exception of analysis, analysis is an upgrade to plan of action and pretty much every practice makes perfect setup. But I think that's a reasonable amount of power creep to see in a class, and they're not giving too much to Seekers. Like Daisy Walker is the only Seeker I think got tremendously stronger in this expansion. Meanwhile, like every rogue that fights got a lot out of dirty fighting in Underworld Market, except for Tony, which is perfect because he's the only one that doesn't need a buff. You got difficulty zero and survivors, which obviously the two best survivors are great at, but a lot of other survivors can get some value out and try to bend their decks around, and that's very interesting for those other survivors. There are a lot of characters I look forward to playing, a lot of ideas I look forward to trying, and on the whole, I find Arkham Horror engaging and exciting, and it just doesn't feel like the things that are broken are necessarily problematic. Except for Tony. Every time an expansion comes out, I worry that Tony's going to make green characters not get anything good. And I was really pleasantly surprised with the Scarlet Keys, because it did a wonderful job of printing a bunch of cool, awesome new cards for green characters that Tony got nothing out of. It honestly looks to me like they're bending over backwards to try to do that, and like, that sucks for them that Tony's such an ongoing problem, but they did a great job of doing it. Anyways, that's it for now. I've been Rather Than Coherence. Hope you enjoyed listening to me ramble about investigators for what I assume is going to be close to two hours. If you did, like, comment, subscribe. All that stuff really does help the channel grow, and I do greatly appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one.